Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we have been doing this podcast now for going on seven years, over 300 episodes. And in all of those episodes, Kobus, not once have we talked about the NGO world, nonprofits, aid in the Chinese context, in large part because it doesn't really exist. Uh, this is something when we think of aid workers and NGOs and nonprofits in Africa, we tend to think, for the most part, of white people doing that and of Western countries doing it. You know, aid is now a huge business from the West, from USAID, DFID, which is the British aid agency, the Canadian aid agency, the Swedish aid agency, huge interests all across Africa. It's a big business. Uh, but it's, for the most part, an industry dominated by whites, and it's not something that the Chinese have made a priority or Chinese culture has made a priority. And that's in part because nonprofit and volunteerism and aid uh, within Chinese society is also something that is relatively new. But what's interesting is that we're seeing the emergence of a younger generation that is much more connected on social media, that's much more engaged in, say, wildlife conservation, or what we've talked about in the past, China House Kenya, which is you know, run by uh, a friend of our show, Huang Hongxiang. Uh, and he's representative of this new younger generation of young Chinese who are engaging in nonprofit and, and aid and these types of kind of human development services, which is relatively new phenomenon. What we're also seeing through the work of these people is the development of a new uh, kind of space of interaction between China and Africa, you know, which is not not 100 percent the, the the space of the state. You know, in a lot of a lot of um, Chinese engagement with Africa was very government government, um, and the work of these uh, you know kind of these these new groups are actually opening new spaces for new kinds of interaction. And we're going to talk today to two members of a nonprofit working kind of in between Kenya and the United States. We are thrilled to have on the show for the first time talking about nonprofit and aid, but also for the first time on our show, Huang Zhaoyi, who is known by Joni Huang in her American English name. Uh, and uh, Zhaoyi joins us on the line from Nairobi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Glad show. Glad to be here. And then uh, Xiaoyi, Yuan Xiaoyi, also known as Kate, Kate Yuan. Uh, is another member of Care for All Kids, both of them working together for this new NGO that see that's come up. And Kate, uh, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. I'm going to go back and forth between Kate and Xiaoyi because Zhaoyi and Xiaoyi sometimes sound a little bit similar. So we might kind of throw your English names in there just to keep the variety. No problem. Okay. So both of you um, are involved with Care for All Kids. I understand that. Are you guys the founders of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it, so you know, let's start first before I get into kind of you know both your family politics on this because I am sure your parents must have been thrilled when you told them you wanted to start a nonprofit in Africa. Uh, Chinese parents, <laughs> for the most part, do not encourage their children to do this. They send you to the United States to study. They spend a lot of money to you go to great universities, and then they want you to join Goldman Sachs and make a lot of money and get married and have kids and then kind of move back to Beijing. You have taken a very different path. Uh, so t first of all, let's get started by telling us a little bit about what is Care for All Kids. Xiaoyi, why don't you start and kind of give us a little bit of background on the group that you guys have started. Right. So I first came to Kenya in 2013 and volunteering for one informal school in Kasarani, Nairobi. And um, at that time, my first time going abroad and um, doing something like volunteering and aid work. And when I go, got back to the United States, I, because I felt pretty attached to the people, so I, I kept fundraising for them. And Zhao Yi was my high school classmate, and then she joined me in fundraising effort. So after this, I volunteer in some other nonprofit in the United States and Asia, and also intern in quite a few nonprofits. And I started to also learn public policy in my university, New York University, and I learned more about how to do this in a more systematic, scalable, and replicable fashion. So we came back to um, Nairobi again this summer to develop this larger scale teacher training program to help more unqualified informal school teachers to get their qualification and training. 
So I wasn't actually aware that that Kenya had this kind of massive problem of getting the the teachers who are already working as teachers getting them certified. Um, can you t talk us through a little bit about what kind of what specific problem you you're focusing on in your work and, and how you propose to to solve it? So actually, in formal schools, which are neither public nor private schools, especially in the, in, in the uh, scope of basic education, are the largest sector in basic education that provide more than majority of Kenyan's children's education. However, because we've been working with informal school for all these years, we know the teachers, they just graduate from high school, and some of them even just had a primary school education, and then they start teaching. I mean, teaching, I think, is a profession that requires a lot of skills, if not more. For instance, we wouldn't want the unqualified doctor to serve us. Then how can we allow a lot of so many unqualified teachers to teach our, edu te teach our children to give them substandard education? So we found actually more than half of them are more untrained, have no uh, professional development at all since they start teaching. So that's what you, you – is teacher training is kind of the core – you know, looking at your at your prospectus and looking at your kind of your PowerPoint slides, it, it has the look and feel of an American kind of NGO and aid organization. And I think you do that, obviously, for raising money and for kind of communicating what you want to do. But it also strikes me a little bit that, you know, Western aid into Africa over the past 50 years has totaled over a trillion dollars. And yet... Mm -hmm. The development, the human development indexes, you know, measured by the United Nations, measured by the IMF, World Bank, any of the different groups have not moved up. And it really paints that a lot of aid has been a tremendous failure in, in, in aid groups themselves. And you'll see, for example, if you spend any time in the Nairobi aid community or in major hubs like Kinshasa or, or some of the other areas where there's aid workers, one of the big problems is the fact that a lot of the people who actually run these aid programs have no idea what they're doing. So they're as ill-prepared in many ways as the teachers that you're training. They don't know the local culture of these aid, rep, you know, these aid people. They don't know the languages. They don't know the cultural dynamics. They graduate from Tufts or NYU or Brown with a degree in development studies, and, and then they head off to Africa wanting to do the Good Samaritan Save the World. So I guess my question for you is, as you approach this endeavor – particularly both of the fact that both of you are Chinese, and the Chinese, again, do not have the same history that Westerners do okay. in this. How are you approaching this differently than, say, two white American university graduates who have the same background as you do? What are you doing that's different and that's distinctively Chinese about it? I think I want mm -hmm. to first answer why my um, pitch deck is so American. I think what's so American about it is the concept of social enterprise. I think that's a pretty new phenomenon in the United States as well, which is to do nonprofit in the form of for profit to make it sustainable in the sense that it would generate its own own income source instead of rely heavily on donation. That's what we're doing. And I think what's so Chinese about us is we are we have been working with uh, the people for a very long time, for three years before we even start any large scale program. And before we push it to really large scale, like across Nairobi, across Kenya, we have done a lot of testing along the way. So, for instance, we just did our pilot for 200 teachers in August to see whether we can really control the cost of teacher training before we start our alpha test, which would be uh, this November to do a three weeks training, the first phase of a two year certified course for um, 100 teachers in Kasarani. And I think Joni has more uh, field experience. Maybe she can talk more about how she works with the locals. Yeah, so yes. um, our main approach is that we will work with the local teachers and let everyone do their best with their knowledge. Like, for example, either Kate or either we are major in education. So then we what we're doing is to use our skills in like fundraise or in like program management to help control or uh, to help um, improve the whole program in its um, long way. To do our best and as for like the teaching we we'll ha heavily rely on the teachers experience and what they know and what they f know about the community needs so currently i'm working with two local school managers in our program and we 
together we explore and develop the planning that we have to help the local teachers. So in this case, so when I leave Nairobi, this program will left to be one that will be take um take in charge by the local teachers and they will know what to do best when they want to carry on the program and scale it up to more places. Joni, um, in can you be can you tell us a little bit about what specifically is being taught to teachers? Like, is it is it mostly kind of teaching methodology and ways to run a classroom and to to be an efficient teacher, or is it does it also um, contain like the actual content that they will be teaching, the maths or science or whatever that they that they'll be t- actually teaching the children? Yeah, that's a very good question. So what we're doing, the teacher training, we're focusing in the national exam, which is uh, national exam qualification, which is like the first step that you need to enter the teaching quality, uh, the teaching profession. So then in this exam, they require you to have like in the things that you have mentioned, like teaching methodology, child psychology, um, this kind of are like a must have in their in their curriculum. And since that we're based in early childhood education, so they will focus more in the interaction with the children. And we're following the the official curriculum that offered by the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. So then after they take the, our, our course will be about like one year and a half and two years, it will be in-service training, which means that these teachers are already in school. So during school time, they will be still teaching their children but with a regular evaluation provided by our college to keep track of their improvement. And when the school holiday came, it's about a month, every three months, then all these teachers would gather in the teaching college to learn about how to um, adapt what they learn in the curriculum to with their practical teaching. So then when after this one month, they'll go back to school again and then use what they have applied. After two years of a whole period of training, they will register and take the exam that, that um, will be recognized by the national government. So then they will be a legally registered teacher. How are you paying for all of this? Where does your, your funding come from? Mm-hmm. Um, so regarding the funding, one of the main goal of our plan is that we want to make it as sustainable as possible, which that they should not be like heavily re- rely on the outside funding. So what we are doing now is that we are providing them with a seating fund, with a starting up fund, which that we will pay some of the training costs upfront. And then we are figuring out a financing option so then the teachers will be able to repay it back. But where do you get your, where where does the funding for Care for All Kids, who who is supporting Mm -hmm. you to do all of this work and to pay for the year and a half of training? I I understand you want to make it self-sustaining, but at the end of the day, yeah. you have administrative costs and things like that. Where are you raising your funds from? So the very um, beginning, we, we raised it from mm-hmm. our friends and family from China, and they donated through WeChat. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, because now we require a lot, uh, uh, a lot more money, so I'm doing it in the you know, United States. I think New York has a tradition of uh, fundraising for nonprofits. But do you think there's an opportunity to kind of develop the philanthropic space in China? I mean, particularly both among wealthy individuals, even though it's still kind of a new concept, or as an extension of corporate social responsibility programs for Chinese companies operating in places like Kenya. Do you think there's an opportunity to grow that? Um, I think there definitely is, but I mean, the culture isn't there. So right now, it wouldn't like do us a lot of benefit to only pursue Chinese funding, especially I think uh, Chinese corporates or even for our friends and family, they donate not well, partly because it's a good cause, but more because they know us to support us individually. But I think the concept of fundraising and uh, donating and corporate social uh, responsibility is more um, pre- prevalent in the United States, that people would just do it. Um, the culture is already there. So we will definitely try to pursue some Chinese funding, but that wouldn't be our main focus, I would say. I was struck by the the um, amount of media attention you got from the Chinese media. So I saw that China Daily and CCTV are some of the some of the people listed as as having covered having covered the, the project. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us like what kind of response you've gotten in China uh, from doing this project, uh, and and how how the project is being explained to a Chinese audience? Um, I think so. I'm, we're pretty happy about all the Chinese coverage. Um, and we found, I think that's something striking about Chinese and African. 
they're such a very tight group that once someone's doing something, you get all the support from Chinese people very, very quickly. And um, the coverage for us, besides introducing uh, how the programs run, they also focus on two of us individually as two young girls doing such a thing in Nairobi, especially uh, Zhao Yi is going to st uh, stay here for entire year after deferring her study in Beijing. So I think there is some personal story as well. And I, I would say the... I would say the feedback from audience are largely positive and there would be follow-up story uh, for her stay here. Zhao Yi, you know, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about kind of the response and the reaction that you get on the ground. It reminds me a little bit of, yeah. you know, in China, that if you are a African-American or you're a Filipino and you want to teach English in China, they will turn you away because they say, no, 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 white people are the only people that speak, that teach English. You know, that's very common. And, uh, and, I, and, and I kind of think about that in the context of, of aid in Africa, that there's an expectation that if you're working for an NGO, <laughs> that you're white. Mm -hmm. And here come two young Chinese women kind of saying, we've got this idea, we're going to do this. What is the reaction on the part of stakeholders in Kenya, Africans who may not be familiar or accustomed to seeing Chinese in this context? Chinese are very commonly seen on construction sites, in banking sectors, in government, in diplomacy, but not in aid and not in teacher development. What is the reaction that you get from people uh, on the ground when you interact with them? That's a very good question. And it's, in fact, a very big challenge that we're facing right now. So as like Kate and I, we, when we're discussing, we usually said that this is a Munzungu factory. Like in, um, in Kiswahili, they, they say that white people is Munzungu. So we got to be white as well. So then um, one big challenge that throw on us is that because the skin color is getting involved in. So what do you think is that they will see you more as a funder or more as a sponsor than you are actually part of them to be working in the same team? So with like this mindset putting in front of us, it's really hard for us to figure out like when we're talking about numbers, budgets, financial, then what are the really numbers that we're dealing with? Are they being like very honest with us as we're part of the team to get through like what we really need? Or are they just like giving you like kind of stories or like giving you kind of like exaggeration? So um, when Kate and I, we first got to Nairobi, what we are doing is that we try to keep a little bit low profile. Like we don't directly approach people telling them, you know what, like we are fundraising, we have like outside funding source. What we're doing is that we tell them that we are volunteers for Care for Orchids. So then we are grabbing the local information for Care for Orchids. So in this way, they will start like cooperating with us, but we try to limit the expectation that they might put on us. So to get like a truer picture. And Kate, what's the reaction you get from the Chinese community in Nairobi? Well, the first question they ask, are you safe? <laughs> Why are you in Africa? <laughs> Is everything okay? <laughs> there has been, so on our WeChat um, channel, there have been people checking us every day. I haven't heard of, from you for a few days. Are you still okay there? <laughs> so in their imagination, Africa is somewhere pretty dangerous, mosquito and a lot of diseases. Um, but I think we spend quite a lot, quite a bit of time explaining what we're doing and our philosophy uh, on our uh, WeChat channel. And we actually got a lot of response from the Chinese friends we have. Some of them are studying abroad, some of them are studying in China. Now, not, now university students, a lot of them want to join us and come to Nairobi. The one problem is actually uh, this sort of work takes time. You take time for people to uh, get to know you, get to trust you. That's why Zhao Yi has to stay there at least for one year for this to continue. But when our friends or our um, young Chinese student wanted to come, they can only come for like two, two weeks, three weeks, or at most a summer. That would be a starting point for them to know about development work in Africa. But that, but that wouldn't be enough for them to really work on something, in our opinion. So um, it, when you when you do this uh, this education training, obviously they are in the U.S., in China, and in in Africa, they are radically different ideas about about primary education and 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 ideas about how you get kids to learn. Um, where are you positioning yourself in terms of the actual way that you teach um, and the, the 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 kind of teaching methodology that methodology that you that you are uh, transmitting to these teachers i think um mm -hmm. so the curriculum we're using now so our training will be entirely the same as the government training colleges in kenya 
We do this because sometimes I think Westerners or even Chinese impose what we think education is to the teachers instead of asking what they need. And so we did a survey to uh, to more than 200 teachers across Nairobi. And what they answer is they want a certificate. So there are many, many uh, training programs like Tusume, um, Tayari by USAID, uh, USAID and UKID. But what they do is they, they do what the, um, Americans or British think is good education and they train the teachers that way. I think that's good. That's, that there's, no, there's no flaw about that. But the problem is what do the teachers want? For them, the certificate is a huge thing. With that certificate, that means they're now qualified. They can teach and they could find a better job with it. So what we do is providing the class for that certification. And that class is very well um, designed by the uh, Kenya government already. So we're just using that with no addition on our own. Jolly, can you talk more about it? Yeah, tell us what you think, Jolly. So what we are doing right now is like we're following the government the government curriculum, but in addition, we try to adapt something new. Where we're trying to bring in the online aid platform, which is kind of because the smartphone is quite um, is quite popular here, even among our teachers from the informal schools. So what we are trying to do, the next step that we were trying to take is that we try to test that whether bringing in the online learning platform to put in some of the some of our training content just from the books, like something that you can read when you're at home, so then you don't have to spend the time in the classroom, or even there will be like more interactive way that we can try to, you know, improve the quality. This is the next step that we're also trying to make. So then if one, that they can cut down the cost that you actually have to physically be in the school. And then the second is that maybe this is something that the interaction, interactive part from a online app can improve that because most of our teachers that we're dealing with, they are not quite literate as those teachers that who attend like proper good universities. So this might be actually a better way to, you know, for the, for the recognition, for the cognitive learning outcome. Xiaoyi, I'd like to kind of close our discussion to try to put what you are doing in a broader context. Do you mm-hmm. think that the, the emergence of you and Zhao Yi Kind of, and again, people like Huang Hongxiang doing China House in Kenya is part of a bigger trend of more young people being interested in getting involved in nonprofit work. Or do you feel that you are the outliers and you're still kind of the the pioneers in this space for Chinese, uh, you know, the social entrepreneurs and people interested in aid and development? I think there's definitely a trend. I think it's starting right now. So I would say because China is, is prospering and people are studying abroad, having a more international perspective. And when they do, even they're still in China, they have the chance to know about Africa. And then they have this chance to come here and see for themselves. And I think how to do, like, I, I think attention is there. But uh, that attention is right now channeling into action of actually for Chinese to stay in there and doing the development work that Zhao Yi and I are doing, including the China House you're mentioning. Yeah, Kobus, you know, it's very interesting to see that there is this new generation. You and I have seen this certainly in the wildlife space where young Chinese are much more active and they are very much making their voices heard to the Chinese government about ivory and rhino and, you know, killing of dogs and, you know, in so many different kind of aspects of the wildlife. We haven't seen it on the human development side. But I guess the hope that I have, Kobus, is that, you know, in in many ways, you know, and for longtime listeners of the show, they'll know that I'm a, a very passionate critic of the aid industry after having kind of lived it and seen it up close. Um, I find it to be one of the most repulsive industries actually in Africa today, in part because there is so much money that is wasted, so many tactics and techniques. I think that Zhao Yi was talking about, or, or Xiao Yi was actually talking about how the American way and the British way is to tell you how to do something instead of actually listening and asking people what's the best way. And so I guess if we do see the rise, Kobus, of a Chinese aid business that comes into Africa, I'm, I'm just hoping that it will approach it in a very different way. I agree. I think if there are, if, if it's possible to develop these spaces, um, uh, you know, that, that we that we discussed today, spaces where there's there is, can actually be a discussion between 
between uh, foreign agents with who, who bring some kind of foreign foreign um, donations with them and African educational institutions or, you know, kind of like where there can be a discussion about how Africans do things and how that way of doing things can maybe be done better. Um, that, I think, is very encouraging. And, and you know, kind of if China plays that role in the China-Africa space, that would be amazing. The organization is Care for All Kids. The website is careforallkids.org. Uh, Huang Zhaoyi is the program management uh, program manager. Joni Huang is her English name. Uh, joins us on the line from Kenya. And uh, Xiao, Yuan Xiaoyi, uh, Kate Yuan, is doing development. Both of them are Chinese, kind of leading this exciting new nonprofit out of Nairobi. Um, I don't know if we have any rich people listening to us on our show. I, I hope we do. But if people wanted to donate or to get involved with Care for All Kids, is there a place, you know, Kate, that they could actually contact you? And do you have a Kickstarter, an Indiegogo, or anything like that to raise money? Um, right now, there is donate. Uh, there will be a donate button on our homepage, so they can check it out there. And we also you can contact through email via info at careforallkids.org. And that would be also for people who want to want to work with you, correct? Right. Fantastic. Well, listen, we wish you both the best of luck. Uh, we're very excited to see you guys coming onto the scene, hopefully bringing some different perspectives and a different approach than what we've seen in the past. And we, we thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. For Kobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. We'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.